Edward was not entirely without hopes of some favourable change in his mother towards him, and on that he rested for the residue of their income. About four days after Edward's arrival, Colonel Brandon appeared to complete Mrs Dashwood's satisfaction. No rumour of Lucy's marriage had yet reached him, he knew nothing of what had passed, and the first hours of his visit were consequently spent in hearing and in wondering. And he found fresh reason to rejoice in what he had done for Mr Ferrers, since eventually it promoted the interest of Eleanor. It would be needless to say that the gentlemen advanced in the good opinion of each other as they advanced in each other's acquaintance, for it could not be otherwise. Their resemblance in good principles and good sense, their being in love with two sisters and two sisters fond of each other, made that mutual regard inevitable. After a visit on Colonel Brandon's side of only three or four days, the two gentlemen quitted Barton together. They were to go immediately to Delaford, that Edward might have some personal knowledge of his future home and assist his patron and friend in deciding on what improvements were needed to it and from thence to proceed on his journey to town. After a proper resistance on the part of Mrs Ferrers, Edward was admitted to her presence and pronounced to be again her son. And therefore, after such an ungracious delay as she owned to her own dignity, she issued her decree of consent to the marriage of Edward and Eleanor. What she would engage to do towards augmenting their income was next to be considered, and here nothing was promised, either for the present or in future, beyond the £10,000 which had been given with Fanny. It was as much, however, as was desired, and more than was expected by Edward and Eleanor. With an income quite sufficient to their wants thus secured to them, they had nothing to wait for after Edward was in possession of the living, but the readiness of the house, to which Colonel Brandon was making considerable improvements. Eleanor, as usual, broke through the first positive resolution of not marrying till everything was ready, and the ceremony took place in Barton Church early in the autumn. They had, in fact, nothing to wish for, but the marriage of Colonel Brandon and Marianne, and rather better pasturage for their cows. Mrs Dashwood's wish of bringing Marianne and Colonel Brandon together was hardly less earnest. It was now her darling object. With such a confederacy against her, with a knowledge so intimate of his goodness, with a conviction of his fond attachment to herself, what could Marianne do? And so it was. Instead of falling a sacrifice to an irresistible passion, as once she had fondly flattered herself with expecting, instead of remaining even for ever with her mother, and finding her only pleasures in retirement and study, she found herself at nineteen, submitting to new attachments, entering on new duties, placed in a new home, a wife, the mistress of a family, and the patroness of a village. Colonel Brandon was now as happy as all those who best loved him believed he deserved to be. In Marianne he was consoled for every past affliction. Her regard and her society restored his mind to animation and his spirits to cheerfulness, and that Marianne found her own happiness in forming his was equally the persuasion and delight of each observing friend. Marianne could never love by halves and her whole heart became in time as much devoted to her husband as it had once been to Willoughby. Willoughby could not hear of her marriage without a pang. That his repentance of misconduct, which thus brought its own punishment, was sincere, need not be doubted. But he lived to exert, and frequently to enjoy himself. His wife was not always out of humour, nor his home always uncomfortable and in his breed of horses and dogs, and in sporting of every kind, he found no inconsiderable degree of domestic felicity. Mrs Dashwood was prudent enough to remain at the cottage without attempting a removal to Delaford, and fortunately for Sir John and Mrs Jennings, when Marianne was taken from them, Margaret had reached an age highly suitable for dancing, and not very ineligible for being supposed to have a lover. Between Barton and Delaford, there was that constant communication which strong family affection would naturally dictate, and among the merits and the happiness of Eleanor and Marianne. Let it not be ranked as the least considerable that those sisters, 
and living almost within sight of each other, they could live without disagreement between themselves or producing coolness between their husbands.